So now that we are all here, um, I'm going to go ahead and call the meeting to order and um, we'll do a quick roll call. So uh, Council Member Falkingham, uh, Angela Smith, Kristen Spencer, here, and Amber Withicombe, here. Thank you. Um, uh, can I get an approval of the meeting minutes of our January 10th meeting? Motion to approve the January 10th meeting minutes. And a second. I think Kristen might be frozen. I think so. <laughs> oh, approve, I second that. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> Um, and so uh, the next item is a discussion with Assistant City Manager and Zoning Administrator Anthony Traxler. So Anthony, once again, thank you for um, joining us tonight. Um, we appreciate your time and of course we appreciate your expertise. Well, just so you guys know, you can, you can I'll come to any of these meetings uh, anytime you need me. Don't, don't feel bad about asking, I'll, I'll be here. Great. Um, so, um, I had sent you a couple of questions um, earlier today just to sort of get the ball rolling. So, let me go through a couple of those and then we will certainly um, open the floor for further discussion or conversation um, just based on how, uh, how we want to proceed. So, um, so the questions that I had sent um, Anthony earlier today, uh, what is covered by Missouri law and therefore cannot be changed? Where did the zoning ordinances come from? Um, and um, for, in other words, um, when they were enacted, uh, the process to change zoning, is that process via voters or the city council? And then the data collected um, regarding complaints, violations, and or condition, conditional uses, and is this tracked? Oh. So zoning is zoning is primarily a local function. So um, really, it, and it's done by city councils. Obviously, the planning commission. Amber's a member of, and Sandy, you're a former member of. That has um, the recommendation. They have obviously the ability to recommend for or against, and depending on whether it's a Hello. administrative or a legislative function, that could change the amount of council votes that would be required. But um, the, the city council uh, um, can change uh, what a property is owned. Uh, they can um, they can change the restrictions within the zoning districts. The individual, whether it be bulk requirements, whether it be definitions, they can basically change really what they want. There are some very rare uh, issues with where states can have, uh, we're, can, we're can basically pass some legislation which causes some issues. But I, I don't, I don't think you'll you'll get there with anything that that you guys are proposing right now. Um, and we would run anything we do by our our legal counsel. Um, before it would go obviously before the council for a vote so but I, I don't anticipate any issues primarily it is a local function um you asked about where did the ordinances come from you, uh, you, over the years there's there's been several iterations uh, of the code the most recent and when i say recent it's approximately 42 years old uh, the city in in i believe it was 80 maybe late 79, paid a consulting firm named Team 4. I don't even believe they're out anymore, but if anyone's in the planning or architect field, they've seen Team 4 documents. And um, they did a complete rewrite of our zoning ordinance. Wow. They also did an, an amendment to our uh, rewrite of our, our comprehensive plan, which is also referred to as a comprehensive plan and land use guide. Um, if you ask me, they basically probably copied a lot of it from primarily the East Coast. And um, a lot of that language is in there because if you look at some of the language, 
you know, they'll refer to it as, um, you know, garden apartments where uh, other areas of the country might refer to them as courtyard apartments. And basically that's just what you'd see your typical apartment complex with a, seriously, with a garden or a courtyard in the middle. I mean, kind of a common space, but because of the term garden apartments and elevator apartments, that's my supposition that they, they, they basically pirated ordinances or, or took ordinances and language from East Coast municipalities. Um, my old boss, uh, his name was Wayne Oldroyd for the city of Maryland Heights. He was a city planner his entire life and he did a lot of work in New Jersey. And when I first got here, I saw some of these, some of the, the, the names of some of these districts and I, I was kind of um, perplexed by it. I hadn't seen anything like it. And I had asked him for some guidance and he told me that, 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 that he's, he's certain that's what they did. It's unfortunate they didn't um, just simplify it, which we can do. Um, I, I'll refer to Maryland Heights a lot if you guys are looking for ideas because they have a, one of the top notch planning departments. And for many years they had the premier planner in this region. It was my former boss, Wayne, I was just referring to. A lot of cities and municipalities will just have, they'll just assign a number system, you know, like an R1, R2. R3 or a C1, C2, maybe an I1, I2, which would be like industrial. Um, and that is really the easiest way to do it. Um, we also have some districts in our code that we don't even use. I mean, if you go in our zoning map and compare some of the, 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 the text uh, for some of these like planned residential office, we don't have it. Um, I would just eliminate that district. It, it doesn't really make any sense to have it. Uh, we can always create a district if a, if a use comes in, right? So you ask, I mean, to get off the subject, you ask where the zoning ordinances come from. It was primarily from this team four group in the 80s. And over the years, uh, there were certain amendments. Um, a lot of times it was primarily because we had a business that didn't fit and so they would amend the district, whether it be permitted or a conditional use to allow that in that district. Um, that, that's kind of how, how it's gone so far. Um, process to change voters or councils, that, that would be, be the councils. Now, if you're gonna do something um, substantial, I would absolutely recommend um, overkill on transparency and overkill on letting residents know what it is you're doing. This is not a shout at our neighbor to the south, but Webster Groves enacted a, a, um, a sweeping change um, to basically eliminate single family zoning. I haven't studied it much. I've done some reading on it. So I don't want to in any way, shape or form pretend that I know exactly what happened but I do know there was a referendum election, meaning the residents didn't like what the council did and they actually overturned it, which is highly unusual. We've had three referendum elections in Maplewood's history. All three passed by, by over 70%. So that to actually have it overturned means, I don't know if enough homework was done. Um, having said that, maybe they did do it and people just don't pay attention and to, to what you do, you know, Amber and Sandy, you guys have been in a lot of these meetings. It's hard to get people to pay attention. So I don't wanna say they did something wrong. All I'm saying is if somebody comes and says, hey, you're gonna make this change, I didn't know about it. I would love to have a very long, lengthy list where we, we tried to solicit public input. And I think it's critical um, to make sure when you, you point it out, you point out the pros and cons, you know? Every time you may make a change here, if you do something substantial, um, if, if there are cons to acknowledge those cons, but say, hey, you know, we as public policymakers believe that the pros um, far exceed the cons and that's why we're going with it. Um, Amber and Sandy, I hate to keep picking on you. I'm sorry about this, Kristen, but they're on these committees. We just had that restaurant, right? We're, you know, on uh, next to White Castle where clearly some people aren't totally happy with it, but the overall, you know, you remember when, when the, the residents were, asking about it. I was at the meeting. Their, 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 their concerns and their complaints were legitimate. People want to be, they want to know exactly what all sides are if you're going to make any 
um, substantial changes. Um, zoning can affect property values on some, you know, in some people's perspectives, and that's why they really get. Um, that's why they really get um, boisterous is a good probably way to put it if you're going to make major changes. But you guys could change everything really if you want. Doesn't mean you won't be challenged. Doesn't mean somebody won't sue the city. Anthony, can I ask a question for a little bit of elaboration? You mentioned that at the same time that the codes were rewritten, um, a comprehensive plan was adopted. And is that comprehensive plan essentially the zoning map? No, comprehensive plan is more long, long range. It's more uh, general. It, it'll be, uh, I can email <clears throat> um, out to everybody what our current comprehensive plan is, but it's basically uh, long range planning. It's kind of supposed to be the underlying document which shows more of the long range goals for the city. I don't know what was passed by uh, the state but it would have probably been back in mid 2000s. But we used to have to, anytime we would amend a zoning ordinance, also have to amend our comprehensive plan. Um, that went out the window a while back. It went out the window right before our Walmart went in because they tried to challenge us on that, but then that had been changed. Um, but again, I, I'm not trying to knock, knock team four too much, but when you look at the zoning map and you look at the comprehensive plan, it's basically one and the same. They basically kind of, took what was was already there and zoned it according to, to that. There are some exceptions. Um, and keep in mind, Maplewood's an inner ring city with an urban urban feel. Uh, we're not we're not cornfield development, you know, we're not St. Charles um, or where I live, Columbia, Illinois, where it's you know vast amounts of open space. So you can go in and, you know, really get in the nitty gritty with what you want. So there are provisions in our code that do allow some flexibility. So we didn't um, we didn't basically make some of these buildings obsolete. When you get to the non-conforming section in our code, in our zoning ordinance, you'll see there's sections of the code that allow buildings that are non-conforming, meaning you may have a commercial structure in a residential district, you may have a residential structure in a commercial district. You can get a conditional use permit to continue the uh, use, what was the original intent and purpose of this. Um, again, it works both ways, uh, what commercial to residential, residential to commercial. So that's kind of unique. I'd never seen that before, but I'd always work for more cornfield. Like I'll use that phrase again. I realize I'm using it loosely, but I've always worked more in that type of zoning environment where they would have never allowed something like that just because of because of the way it was developed. Um, so that is it, that does give, a, give the council a little bit more flexibility. It also doesn't make some old corner confectionery that's clearly a commercial business, it's always operated as a commercial business. Um, doesn't basically preclude those people from using the building as it was originally intended for. Um, so you can create certain exceptions in there too, if you'd like, if, if you decide to go that route, but that is a very useful tool. Um, the idea of a non-conforming structure or use really is to eliminate it. And in some cases, it's too harsh. And somebody recognized that in Maplewood years ago and, and added that provision. Mm -hmm. I think it was an excellent provision to add. So just a quick follow on about that comprehensive plan. It has not been substantially altered or updated since it was created or since it was initiated right. you said in the early 2000s yeah uh okay. well that would have been i think that boy i need to look at that i think it's probably right around the same time but there have been numerous updates to it but again they were all i think the last one we did is when the high school um purchased those single family homes across to the north between mm -hmm. um near Florent, I can't think of it's Oakland or Gerhard in between uh, there. Oakland, yeah. And they, they, they leveled those homes to, to, to expand the parking lot. So they, we amended the comprehensive plan at that time. In addition to that, we rezoned that property from single family residential to um, public activity, which is what schools are, are located in. Um, that was probably the last time. Um, the, uh, I'll call it the auto slash apartment uh, development, which is the, um, along Hanley Road, 
uh, extension of Sun and we amended the comprehensive plan back then as well. Um, but I, so I'll send you the amendments and you'll see some plates towards the end where you can see where we've updated the plan. It, it needs, it, we could use a new update, but again, it's not as critical as it used to be. Um, just because for the most part, people go by zoning more than anything, but it, it never hurts to go through and look at that as well. I think at this point, I would just focus on the zoning map. Um, when I was in Columbia, Illinois, again, you know, they may have anywhere from 500 to 1,000 lots platted, basically a property that was undeveloped, but it was going to be developed in the future. We went through and amended our, our um, comprehensive plan every five years. Um, and that, that's, that's much more common to do so. But for a city like Maplewood, unless you're really planning on changing the overall use of an entire area or entire region, you know, it's, it's really not critical. I think your zoning ordinance is more critical. I think your last question was data collected regarding complaints, violations, or conditional uses. <clears throat> um, we have that. And I know I'm going to meet on the, with the park board tomorrow. And I think I'm going to meet with another ordinance committee in the future. <clears throat> I know Matt, the acting chief of police, met with the offenses, which is more like nuisance. We don't write many violations at all from our zoning ordinance. Um, it's primarily in chapters 12, which would be our buildings and building regulations. Mm -hmm. And chapter 14, which is our, our business license. So although there's some, you know, you make it may, some of these may kind of blend in together. Um, most of the violations we write would be building code violations, which is basically covered in chapter 12, buildings and building regulations. Mm -hmm. And we have multiple codes within that. And basically, they're all the international building codes. We are currently operating under the 15 International Residential Code, which covers single family and duplexes. And then the International Building Code, which covers the rest of the structures, including commercial. Um, we also have, uh, we've also adopted the International Property Maintenance Code, uh, plumbing, mechanical, uh, and electrical as well. And um, we adopt those codes to mirror St. Louis County, not because we're required to, but um, because it makes more sense to have uniformity where possible. I just uh, had a realtor speak with a city manager luncheon the other day and he's frustrated because some cities are always lagging behind. And I can understand that, but really people say, well, your code is 12 years old, what's going on? A lot of times the, the changes they make to those are very minor. Um, so. Our property maintenance code, for example, is 06, um, very old. There's a lot of cities that are up to 18, but nothing substantial has changed. That doesn't mean we can't adopt the 18 tomorrow, but um, there's just been no major updates that we, we thought were um, worthy. And, um, but as far as mechanical, electrical, plumbing and building and residential, we always mirror the county property maintenance, every city is most likely on the same, but they may just be different years, but there's very little difference between them. I know those were just on the council agenda uh -huh. um, last week. So I think it was plumbing, electrical, and uh, mechanical. I think. And the majority of the violations <clears throat> would, would come out of that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I could go into my notes and, I mean, we have... Uh, language in the zoning ordinance about uh, trailers parked, you know, like people, we, we, we've had some landscaping businesses that turn the street into a storage spot for their trailers. And that's within our accessory uses section of the zoning ordinance. So we would actually write um, a violation and reference that section. But um, my understanding from prior conversation with Michael's, we're, we're looking to see if there's a lot of re repeat problems to see if we can maybe make an amendment and address it. Mm -hmm. I don't really see that in this section of the code, but there's definitely amendments that can be had in other sections of the code, not this, but not what this group is focusing on. 
So can I maybe um, clarify? So if you're, if we're getting consistent, maybe not violations, but consistent requests or complaints about a certain aspect of the zoning. So um, like you know, something like the accessory dwelling units, um, the, the zoning related to that. Do you have a way of tracking how many people have already asked for either um, uh, exceptions or conditional use or other um, ways around that? So we don't, we wouldn't track that as a violation. We would just track that, but we could, we could pull that. Mm -hmm. um, it'd be either somebody to ask me or, or for the most part, they usually ask Brian. Mm -hmm. I believe you're talking, if I'm, if I'm wrong, please let me know. Somebody wants to turn the, the second floor of their garage into uh, uh, an apartment. Is that, is that what you mean by that, Councilmember Phillips? Yeah, yeah. So something like that, or um, in the case of um, the, I, I know the, the coffees with their Airbnb, they had to use, you know, they had to construct um, a, a structure that actually connected it to their house because of the zoning yeah. regulations that we have. So, yeah, I mean, if there's a way that we can find out how many people have either complained or asked or um, about those those ordinances. I think that's important to know. I will talk with Brian and uh, he's our building official mm -hmm. and I'll find out and I'll, I'll send an email out. Um, okay. He's been here for, I could probably give you the last 10 years. I'll give mm -hmm. you a number from the last 10 years. And if it's something we want to you're interested in we can start tracking that easily mm -hmm. we just haven't tracked it because it's more of a hey i'd like to do this and we say unfortunately the way the code is written you can't do this i know i had a um a gentleman on cherry street that wanted to do it and he challenged brian so it came to me mm -hmm. and i'm confident in my interpretation of the code because i've talked to our attorneys in the past because we've had people bring it up yeah. I had to guess he's probably going to say one or two a year, but he might surprise me and say there's more. Yeah. I just don't usually see it unless somebody challenges Brian's interpretation and it comes to me. Um, now we talked, you, you mentioned a while ago, something about, you know, single family only zoning or kind of like what, what um, uh, Webster did and, or I know, I know, I think I've other council members have brought up, uh, and maybe even planning commission members, these accessory structures. I mean, the accessory structure, um, if, you, if you modified that to allow occupancy, um, that would definitely be a way to uh, mm -hmm. make things more affordable. Yeah. For every action, there's a reaction. Um, and I think if you were ever going to do any single family zoning only, you'd probably want to look at certain sectors of town. I don't think you'd want mm -hmm. to do a blanket uh, across the board. I think Webster could have been much more successful if they would have mm -hmm. kind of um, inched their way into it, right? Instead of just doing a blanket, again, I'm not trying to be critical. It's mm -hmm. just, I think that was like a massive amount of their um, of their actual, you know, they are lots within town. Um, but I, I don't know if it makes sense to do that on a lot that's 25 feet wide if they don't have a driveway, right? Because if you when you increase density, um, you also increase um, city services that are required. You could potentially, uh, you know, you're trying to do it to save, uh, to make Maplewood more affordable, which it, it can do. This is kind of what I'm talking about, the pros and cons. You, If it's something you guys want to do. Because people are going to say, well, if you continue to add more families, there's going to be more kids in the school district and it's going to raise my taxes because the majority of your property taxes go to the school district, right? Mm -hmm. um, a large house on um, Elm, for example, brings in a lot more money than a small bungalow on Woodland, right, um, for the school. But if you turn, you know, you've got two families living in there, it's going to put a, a, a strain on services within the school district. So I think you also want to bring the school district into that that discussion just to, you know, because mm -hmm. that will be a challenge as well. Um, but there are ways you can do that. I just think if you're going to do something like that, I believe Seattle, my sister lives there. 
Um, I believe they did something like a, like 10 or 20 percent. And they may have changed it since then. I just know that they kind of inched into it. Mm -hmm. Or my other sister happens to live in Minneapolis and they just, I think, did a blanket thing, right? So yeah. in my view, one city did it the right way and the other didn't. Now, um, you also have to look at the existing infrastructure. It's tough when you compare yourself to like a Minneapolis or a Seattle, right? That's why I'm talking about mm -hmm. looking at certain sector segments of the community and look into that if you guys decide to go there. I don't know if you're considering it anymore, mm -hmm. but I do know that affordability is um, popping up all over surveys, our, our city citywide survey. Um, it's definitely a trend in planning and zoning um, to, to try to figure out ways to make things more affordable. And our, I think our residents, Sandy, I know you saw the uh, survey. I don't know if everybody else did, but it was definitely littered throughout the entire survey. So mm -hmm. I'm assuming you're going to look into that type of those types of options. Um, I wish I had a little more experience with that. Um, but if, if you needed me to do research on that, I could, I could absolutely do that. I just, I can be honest with you. I haven't looked into it too much, but I just mm -hmm. know, um, there are certain areas of town that it may make a lot more sense than others. Yeah. Yeah. You definitely want to make sure people are still going to be able to, um, anytime you treat, in, increase traffic and congestion, it can become a problem. There's some streets that, that, um, it just wouldn't make sense because if you added families and added vehicles, it, would, it could cause some problems in there. And again, wow. I mentioned the school district thing. People don't usually think about that, but you are adding a uh, cost for that. And therefore, you know, it's kind of a, there's a perfect balance there, which I can't tell you what it is, but it's something you guys would probably want to explore. Yeah. Anthony, that, sorry, I just, quick question that that raises for me in terms of looking at certain zones to to for lack of a better word up zone or increased density has the city explored form-based code in order to sort of address how often we need these conditional uses adjusted for all of our no. very diverse types of structures <laughs> right <laughs> yeah and and i again it's form-based is more of a it's more of a recent trend um, at least from my understanding, um, you know, you're basically trying to correct issues of traditional zoning with this form base. You prioritize like buildings, um, kind of try to preserve the community character. There's a lot of times from what I've seen at least, and I have to do research on it. I don't want to try to in any way, shape or form, um, let anyone think here. I've done a lot of research on form based zoning, but I know some of the things they talk about are, you know, building setbacks is a good example, where when you look at our commercial districts, um, a lot of the concerns with form-based zoning are already addressed. We have zero foot uh, lot line setbacks, where a lot of times they'll try to encourage buildings um, up along the street frontage. Uh, they try to promote walkable communities, um, try to preserve the character, um, where a lot of traditional zoning, they kind of focus on the land use itself setbacks and it's kind of like a cookie cutter process where you kind of lose that identity. Uh, I'm not too concerned about that in, and the only aspect I've really lit, thought about it was is in commercial. Now, if you're talking residential, I'd have to do research on that. I don't even want to attempt to um, act as though I understand what's going on with that, but I could absolutely do that. Um, but again, with our I think the character of our, our um, I think somebody actually was thinking of that when they did, they did our zoning ordinance a while ago. Because if you go in the A B district, there's you know if you have a if you have a parking lot in the front, your setback is this. If you have parking in the rear side, it's less. Um, within our residential districts right now, um, if you're thinking about you know potentially changing um, setbacks, there's some areas where it makes a lot of sense. In fact. I want to say Gerhard, we had a, you know, there was a home that burned many years ago. We've actually gone to people when they come in with a, a home design that shows a house set back 25 feet in a single family district. Because and we've said, no, you need to ask for a variance. We, 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 we want this house set back 10 feet like every other home, because it looks kind of odd when you have a home kind of set back. Um, and we've always recommended those and those have always passed, even if they don't necessarily meet the true spirit and intent of a hardship. And so these are the types of things if you're thinking about doing, 
that would be something that staff would be interested in so we don't have to go through the variance process for that. It is very infrequent, but it does happen. Um, mm -hmm. When we did the amendment to the um, AB district, which is the arterial business, which is primarily Big Bend, mm -hmm. um, we, we modified and adjusted the lot depth requirement because none of those lots met the, the lot depth requirement that was written in the code. And it just didn't make any sense to make anyone, if they were wanting to make any improvements to make them get a variance, right? Um, so we occasionally do have that. And so whenever you guys do submit your um, potential changes, I was hoping to, you know, obviously get, get a look at those as well and then, and then meet with staff on that and, and, and try to, you know, because you guys aren't involved on the day-to-day -day stuff that we run into problems with. And so we'd like to like make some comments to that as well. But, um, well, and I think that's kind of what we were getting at when we were talking about how um, sort of complaints or, or requests for variances are tracked, because if there's something that is consistently needing a variance or consistently needing a conditional use, then let's solve it. Yeah. And we could possibly do, instead of just having one single family district, you could have different districts because we do have some areas in town where again, we have 25 foot wide lots. Mm -hmm. Like our minimum requirement is 50 mm -hmm. um, and 6,000 square feet. If you have a 6,000 square foot house in Maplewood, you, a lot, you've got a big lot. Mm -hmm. There's just a lot of areas in town um, that, that don't meet that requirement. Um, We've, yeah. always, we've always taken the approach though, is if somebody wants to add density and as long as they meet the minimum five foot setback, we, for the most part, when I say we I mean staff is for the most part, they gave positive recommendations if somebody needs to get a variance. And I don't recall any major issues with the board of adjustment. Uh, years ago, they were turning down um, ADA access ramps Mm -hmm. Staff got frustrated by that, <laughs> and so we went to the council and we actually took that out of the zoning ordinance, put it in the building uh, section, and gave staff the ability to approve those. Wow. Um, we were worried about legal challenges, but also just about what's right and what's wrong. Wow. Um, so, but we, we we don't have many complaints about that. But uh, I. I guess I took complaints into or, or violations into are we writing people up? Are we giving them citations? I'm I'm glad you pointed that out, uh, Sandy, because I, I can definitely look into some other issues. We don't have a lot of problems with that. We really don't. Yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't have thought that, you know, we're writing violations on on zoning, but um, more of a, a if if it's broken, then let's fix it. And, you know, just because it's been written that way since the seventies or whatever it is. Um, I, I think, you know, we were looking, I was looking at lot size requirements and I don't think my house is conforming um, for a lot size. I no, I don't think any of them are very important would be. I, I really don't believe any of them, you know, would be. And, and so Maplewood, just to give it um, a little history, they, um, probably in the 60s, it's very interesting if, if you go through um, the rezonings, there was a lot of um, corruption and there were a lot of rezonings that took place that simply made no sense. They were approved anyway. There's some apartment complexes, for example, built, you might have a six, eight foot apartment complex built in a single family residential neighborhood with absolutely no parking at all. And um, it doesn't meet any of the requirements of the codes, even at the time, but they were approved. Um, it's really why you have a city manager form of government instead of the commission form of government is there was a lot of, and there were other problems there as well, but it's really interesting if you look in the 60s and I've, I've had to do this. Um, uh, there was a lawsuit a while back where we denied um, an apartment complex owner wanted to uh, add a number of, um, of units in a basement, um, which were questionable from the building code standpoint as far as ingress, egress. And they also had no parking and we got complaints about neighbors constantly about parking spilling out over into their, you know, in front of their homes. And um, 
And that's when I started looking at all these. And I remember asking the former city manager, what is the deal with all these rezonings like in the 60s? And, you know, and, and, he, and he, he gave me that little little history. It's very interesting if you go through the codes. It's a lot of rezonings. And I think there was an attempt by um, the council at the time to try to get additional federal funds. And so they were wanting more, more households in town. And I think they've changed how they dole out some of those federal funds now, but that was, an, that was another thing I I've heard from several people. So they were knocking down a lot of single family homes and trying to put up a lot of uh, apartment complexes at the time. And you'll even see that as you go down some streets, you'll see, you know, single family home, single family home, six family apartment complex. Um, it, 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 they are littered throughout town, but it, it, as big of a problem as it wasn't, as it was obviously illegal back then, it, it does, um, contribute to Maplewood's current housing, which is diverse mm -hmm. and is mm -hmm. affordable. So even though that was not the intent of the time, uh, that is the silver lining. Yeah, I was going to ask one more um, question. And since you mentioned parking, is parking, and I apologize, I haven't looked in a lot of detail in the last month or so, um, is parking in the residential zoning as as well as the um like the nd and the cb and there's actually an extra a supplemental section within the zoning ordinance within chapter 56 that addresses parking it needs to be beefed up that that section is could definitely be improved mm -hmm. it just gives uh -huh. a lot of um flexibility to staff which is fine but Mm -hmm. um, parking is such a, um, it's tough because it, I hate, I'm not, if you look at Gravoy Bluffs, has anyone been to Gravoy Bluffs? If you look at that um, parking lot, it, the term sea of asphalt, very applicable. They, they went on the old retail uh, requirements of five spaces per thousand. Oh, yeah. uh, and it just, it's basically built out for, I'll call it, um, you know, Black Friday uh, or before, you know, we had the internet, right? Where everybody went shopping on that, the day, you know, the day after Thanksgiving, right? Or, you know, those, that week before Christmas, it's built out, uh, it's overly built, right? So when we had the Walmart come in town, we actually adjusted those retail calculations down uh, it's like four per thousand. So even though there's a lot of days where there's a lot of um, excess parking, it's nowhere near what a lot of these retail centers have. Um, and so the trends in retail have been kind of to go down, but you don't want to go down too much because then it starts to spill out. And considering Maplewood's retail and commercial districts are so close to residential areas, you always want to be careful to make sure it doesn't spill out and start impacting residential areas anymore. Mm -hmm. So um, when I say they need, we, we need to be updated, I would just mean we'd be nicer to identify more uses and then identify what those requirements are instead of leaving it generic. Yeah. So do we have, if someone were, um, uh, building a new home on an empty lot or, or rebuilding, um, do we have requirements within residential that they have to have a certain amount of off-street parking or does that, yes, does that not pay? to it real quick. We get so few new homes that I, uh, right. I can tell you what a restaurant is off the top of my head, but I need to go pull that off. I think you asked earlier, what is what, what are the most there was questions about conditional uses, which some of the most used to be restaurants. Mm -hmm. um, Sandy, when you were on the planning commission, we met on a monthly basis, if you remember, mm -hmm. maybe 10 or 11 times. Now we probably meet six times a year. Wow. And that was because we changed the requirements to basically say, if you're uh, bus and primarily for the, the business district, the CB1 and the CB, if you're an existing restaurant facility and you move out, another one can move in as opposed to making that person go through a conditional use permit process again. And that the idea is legally, if, if we turned it down, unless it was substantially similar, we'd lose. Mm -hmm. 
It costs money, staff time. And for small businesses, if you have to wait 45, 60 days, you know, time is money. And it just, it was, they never were turned down. So we kind of amended the zoning ordinance to give a little bit more flexibility on, on um, new ownership of a similar use. Let me find it, Andy, I In apologize. Section It'd be under supplemental, regu supplemental regulations, article three, uh, division two. Division two, okay. And it says uh, attached or detached single family dwellings, two spaces for each dwelling unit, which may include up to one space per unit located on an adjacent street or public right of way. So basically one off street parking space. Okay, okay. Which is, um, is minimal. Yeah, yeah. I was gonna say if it was more than that, then I'd be concerned because with as much public transportation as we have, you know, do we necessarily mm -hmm. need two cars in every driveway kind of thing, so. The fact that it gives you uh, the, the, you know, to say you can use an off street basically just means one and, and you really don't see it that low anywhere. So I, I probably would recommend keeping that. Yeah. Okay. Um, multifamily, it, we also even have multifamily and I'll just read it to you. Consisting of five or more dwelling units, you have one and a half spaces for each dwelling unit, okay. except that two spaces shall be provided for each dwelling unit containing three or more bedrooms. Mm -hmm. Now that may be one, um, you know, why would it be more there than um, for a residential home? And as mm -hmm. you guys go through these, you guys will, yeah, you know, that might be one where you could, you know, reduce, reduce that one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anthony, from an administrative perspective, are there other areas of the code that you think need closer scrutiny or need need to be cleaned up? Honestly, it, aside from just getting rid of like a lot of this, um, I hate to say this East Coast language, you know, mm -hmm. garden apartments, uh, you know, elevator apartments, really, it's just about density, you know, each, each district goes up based on density, right, which is historic zoning, that's really what it's all based about, it's density and setbacks, right. Um, another thing to think about is if you're thinking about allowing things to be more affordable, if you go up, it becomes much cheaper to build, that's another mm -hmm. thought, um, you could, you could modify some of the height restrictions. Mm -hmm. um, if, you're, if you're thinking about new development, how, how to make it more affordable, add another story. It's mm -hmm. just a lot cheaper. Um, but I would, if, if, if anyone's interested, again, I hate to keep referencing Maryland Heights, but just look at their um, uh, district requirement regulations and look at how simplified the process is. Um, I would say if you want to change things and make it more like Maryland Heights, you would get a, a, a round of approval from me. That's for sure. It, and, and it's a really simple process. When you go through it, you'll look at that and say, wow, this is, I see what he's talking about. And, and like you mentioned, if there were some, like some wor small wording we wanted to adjust, something small, what's, what does the process look like to get that changed? I know we take it to the council, but like, does Sandy do that? Like, how, what is it, the actual process? If like? you want to, you can just, you know, get it in a, you know, like a word working document. And then I can take that language and I can draft an ordinance uh, that would go through and make those changes. But before I would send that to the council, I'd make sure to send it back to you as a group to make sure I captured exactly what you're looking for. But mm -hmm. that's all that would need to be done. Yeah. I mean, what I did when we did the, um, retail portions is I just created a working document that was basically I, I cut and pasted the sections of the code and I turned it into a word document mm -hmm. and we had, and we would send that out to the uh, planning commission and we would kind of make changes and I had several different versions and that's how I sent it out but then I changed the I I, I, I that that's when I later turned it into an ordinance form which is very simple mm -hmm. I, I can do that mm -hmm. um We'll make sure, and I'll run that by legal as well, just to make sure there's no issues, but. And I would still like to circle back through P and Z because again, they all have um, a lot of experience with this already. So certainly any changes that we make as a committee 
um, I think we all have agreed that you know we want P and Z to have their input as well before it comes to council. They would actually be required to if they're yeah. here ending the zoning ordinance. Mm -hmm. Now, um, if in the future you're amending items outside the ordinance that you know um, maybe something to do with a business license because there's some sections on business licenses in, in Chapter 14. There's been some times when I've even brought stuff in the subdivision code, which doesn't necessarily require P and Z, I still will bring it to them just to show them because it's still kind of as development related, mm -hmm. just get their blessing. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we would definitely want to have them look at it. That's a very yeah. good point. Yeah. And I guess just to circle back around to the comprehensive plan, because that's actually, that's P and Z. They, they do, they own the comprehensive plan. Yes. Yeah, that's what I thought. The council passes a resolution to adopt it though. Yes. Um, well, we're coming up on uh, the last uh, about five minutes of the meeting. And um, so I just want to make sure if anybody else has any um, burning questions right now before we go on our merry way. I, I had one thing to add if it helps for, for the discussion that we had previously. Um, I can get you a section, I can email a section of our um, property maintenance code out. Mm -hmm. If in the future you guys are looking at changing density, um, if we're trying to add to it, we got to remember there's different sections of the code. So our property maintenance code specifically talks about um, how big a bedroom needs to be. Right. Mm -hmm. How many people can occupy that? I just want to make sure if you guys are getting into discussions that, that that is actually chapter 12 of the city code. That's under the buildings and building regulations. And that's actually within our within our property maintenance code. Mm -hmm. And usually those those all have to do with safety for the most part. You know, basically how many people need to get out? How big does a corridor need to be? How many people can be within the corridor? Um, you know, sanitation, health and sanitation. Um, how many people do you have in a bedroom of a certain size before you have so many extension cords? And so when you're looking at other cities, if you're thinking about that, keep in mind, um, a lot of times those are amended to, to reflect the housing stock in the particular community they're in. So mm -hmm. Maplewood's a lot of their structures were built under a very, very old electric code. So you may walk into one of these uh, older apartment complexes or older homes, and you may have three outlets in the entire room, you know, a large bedroom, right? Whereas if you get an, a home in Chesterfield or Columbia or St. Charles, in that very same size room, there may be three times the number of outlets too. Mm -hmm. So they're obviously trying to avoid extension cords, things like that. All these things come into play. If you uh, ever want to discuss that further, even though it's not really under zoning, I can absolutely, sh we can actually, you know, we can give you some good examples on that too, because that would hopefully help um, maybe guide your guys' discussion if you're trying to uh, increase density. Yeah. I mean, certainly I think those, um, as we start talking about whether ADUs are appropriate based on lot size, um, I think that's definitely part of the conversation. So you mean accessory dwelling units? Yeah. Okay. So one other thing to think, when you go back, and again, zoning kind of, you know, kind of fluctuates, right? Like it, over, over time, you know, what, they're, what people were trying to accomplish. And sometimes they create some rules that maybe they thought was going to be good and ended up having some problems. But we, we had several... Um, 80 use in town. We still have uh, a few uh, Weaver, Flora, where mm -hmm. basically it's just a second dwelling unit. Mm -hmm. And early in the zoning ordinance, I think it's under the general regulations, there's a section in that says you can have one uh, dwelling unit per lot. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you may be looking in the individual um, district regulations. And I actually, I had to look for that to figure out where that was, but that's, that's a common principle. You can have one dwelling unit per lot, unless you wanted to create a carve out within the accessory use section. 
and I'm going to get you guys that information to find out how many we've had. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And uh, that that is a that is a to me that's a really um, good option to look. You could even maybe possibly allow them as permitted or conditional uses, so you could possibly look right. at all these other um, options. Um, and if you're looking at other cities, this, this may be overkill, but you, you may not see conditional uses, just look for special uses. Every city is different. Now okay. that, that gives you guys some flexibility to where if you do make some changes, at least you can kind of look at them on, a, on an individual case by case basis. Mm -hmm. Just remember every time you make something a conditional use, it costs the person filing the application uh money so you know it kind of is counter to what you're trying to do but it does allow the council to review each thing on an individual basis if you were concerned about um parking or congestion of any type mm -hmm. what is the cost to file for conditional use it's, uh 430 dollars and the principal cost of that goes towards we have to advertise um conditional use in, in a, in a, in a uh, newspaper of general circulation. Roughly about $330 is what it costs us. Then we have to um, send out uh, first class mail to every property owner within 300 feet. And that doesn't really include staff time either. So it's mm -hmm. yeah. sounds expensive, but we are not even recovering our costs on that. And that on a conditional use, that's primarily just a one-time thing unless the property changes hands, right? Correct. It's not like they need to pay that every year as a conditional use. Correct. Okay. And I mean, if you're going to be doing, if you're going to be adding an apartment complex, it's not a insurmountable cost. I'm just right. mentioning that. Yeah. Um, and I think, I don't want to speak for the council, Sandy. I think you might have been in there earlier and people were talking about possibly these um, changing that accessory structure section. Mm -hmm. I think the guy on Cherry might have talked to a couple of different council members. And I know mm -hmm. at the time they were thinking of maybe, so I think you would have some support for this, at least from the council's perspective. Yeah, I, th I, I think so as well. You know, we're, um, again, we're all interested and um, concerned about affordability in Maplewood and, and continued gentrification. So um, so I think ADUs are, are one opportunity for us to, to improve increased density without taking too big of a step forward. So, um, well, thank you, Anthony, for joining us tonight. Thank you for your wealth of knowledge. I think it really has um, sort of answered a lot of our just generic questions up to this point. Um, we will definitely reach out for um, future specific questions that come up during the um, during the course of this. But I think our next step, uh, you know, back to the back to the drawing board again. And, you know, now that we have a little bit more knowledge under our belt, um, go back and look at the, the residential zoning with a new set of eyes and come to the next meeting with some you know, some comments about maybe what we'd like to see changed. Um, and then we'll yeah. definitely float those back to uh, to Anthony and the planning and zoning. In the interim, I just want to make sure I'm addressing everyone's concerns. Right now, I need to get with the building official, Brian Hur, and just see roughly how many of these um, ADUs um, we may have turned down mm -hmm. on average and with roughly how many we do it per year is what you're looking for. Is that, that accurate? Is there anything else I need to do? Yeah. If there's anything else that either yourself or um, anyone else at City Hall gets constant questions about regarding zoning, I mean, you know, the, the building codes, different um, different committee, that's actually Mayor Knapper's committee, so I don't want to step on anyone's toes, but if there's any, you know, anything that is related specifically to zoning, um, you know, we'd love to hear that. So, you know, whatever input um, you though, have from staff. Even, I apologize, even though it's not related to zoning, mm -hmm. but since you're talking about density, mm -hmm. would you like me to just 
I can just scan and email that section of the property maintenance code if you're interested. It just yeah. kind of gives you an idea kind mm -hmm. of what we're looking at um, when we go through that. Yeah. Would that oh, be yeah. beneficial? Yeah, definitely. Okay. Yeah. Any any resources like that that you think are helpful? Um, absolutely, I'd rather have too much too much information than not enough. So, I'll get both those to you guys. To, um, should be tomorrow. Great, great. Thank you. Um, so um, we are uh, meeting next month. Um, I don't have it right in front of me. When is our next meeting? Is or, oh, it's another 14th. Yes, Monday the 14th in March. Um, so um, until then, can I have a motion to adjourn? I saw your lips move. Do I get a second? Second. <laughs> and all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, meeting is adjourned. Thank you all for your time tonight. Thank I you. Appreciate Thank you, Anthony. Have a good night, guys. Yeah. See you later. Take care. Mm -hmm.